Mark Hall is the lead singer of the Christian band uh, Casting Crowns, and in his book Life Songs, he tells the following story. He writes, Lori Edwards watched her little girl gasping for air and wanted to breathe for her. She wanted the maker of breaths to swoop in and fill her child's lungs and dissolve every tumor with his mere glance. She wanted another miracle. It was the early morning of Saturday, October 30, 2004. Ten-year-old Aaron Browning lay in a hospice bed in her home in such pain and shortness of breath that in fear and exasperation she could manage only one request of her mother. Just read the scriptures, she said. So Lori began reading the scriptures. She included Aaron's favorite passage, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. From 1 a.m. until 5 a.m., loved ones took turns reading aloud the Word of God over a child in the last, cruelest stages of cancer's grip. Little Aaron had battled for more than three years. And now the end was near. Lori tried to refuse to believe it, but her trust in the Lord remained steadfast. At one point, she placed her Bible on the floor and stood on it, literally standing on the Word of God as she read over her child. Aaron had been six years old when she prayed to receive Christ. She was diagnosed with cancer when she was seven. By the time she was eight, she was visiting area churches to give her testimony. Four months after Aaron was first diagnosed, the second bone scan revealed that the cancer was gone. Doctors called the results remarkable. Lori and Aaron called it a miracle. And emboldened by the Lord's clear hand in her life, she began regularly sharing her faith and giving her testimony. Her mom said she had a desire to reach people and let them know there is no hope or joy without God. And even though she had reason in her life not to be happy, she was joyful because she had Jesus in her heart. She wasn't afraid. She let the Lord speak through her. And when she would get up and speak, it was like I wasn't even listening to my own daughter. He would put words in her mouth, and it was just awesome. But The cancer eventually returned, and this time it didn't go away. The tumors grew so large that they displaced organs and created a visible bulge in Aaron's chest. They pressed down on her spleen, pushed her heart to the right, deviated her trachea, straining her breathing. Near the end, Lori's email updates were desperate. Her last one before Aaron's death was a simple request in all caps, Please pray for Aaron. That was the night on which Lori stood on her Bible during four hours of Scripture reading. It was 51 hours after that that Aaron Friendly gave up her fight. Aaron Browning went home at 4.24 a.m. on November 1, 2004. Lori still doesn't fully understand what happened next. She remembers only a tremendous peace and describes it as being under the shower of the Holy Spirit. She held Aaron's body for 90 minutes while her daughter played in heaven. It was not like how I expected her last minutes to be. I thought I'd be hysterical, but I wasn't, Lori said. She was where she always wanted to be. She told me when she was six years old that she couldn't wait to get to heaven. She said she had felt an emptiness in her heart, but when she asked Jesus into her heart, she never felt that emptiness again because Jesus had filled her and would never leave her. For the ten years she was on this earth, God used her in a remarkable and powerful way. After meeting Erin early in her struggle with cancer and, and keeping up with prayer requests and phone calls that Mark Hall and his band Casting Crowns wrote a song for her. The lyrics to that song read in part, I'll praise you in this storm and I will lift my hands that you are who you are no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried you hold in your hand. You never left my side And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. It's a remarkable story of faith in spite of a very terrible situation. You have to wonder, how could this little girl and her mom cling to God in the midst of such tremendous pain? How were they able to, as the song says, lift their hands even when their hearts were torn? And the answer is, they were worshiping their creator, 
not their circumstances. Even though the storms of life were raging, they were able to look past the conditions to the king who was still in control. We're in the midst of a sermon series I'm calling, But God. I've said that two of my favorite words in the Bible are, But God. Because when those two words show up in the Bible, or the idea of those two words that show up in the Bible, it usually means there's something bad happening but God is about to step in and make a difference. That there's bad news, but God has good news. I love the but gods of Scripture. And today we're going to look at one of my favorites, one of the most important but gods in the Bible. It comes from John 16, verse 33. And Jesus says this, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Quick background on this passage, Jesus is in the final hours before the cross. This part of scripture is known as Jesus' final discourse. These are the things Jesus said to his disciples in the hour just before his betrayal, arrest, and trial. This is his last chance to talk to his closest friends before things get really ugly. And here's what he says. He says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You can almost picture Jesus in this verse like a weather forecaster giving his long-range outlook for the week ahead, and he's saying, well, tomorrow there will be trouble. And the next day there will be trouble. On Wednesday, there's going to be more trouble and Thursday trouble and 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 trouble after that and trouble after that and trouble after that Jesus wants to know that trials and tribulations are coming our way and Jesus isn't talking about well I lost my car keys kind of trouble or, or I can't get my garage door to come down kind of trouble Jesus is talking about soldiers knocking on your door kind of trouble Jesus is talking about cancer on the lab report kind of trouble. Jesus is talking about your kids turning their backs on you or your spouse walking out the door kind of trouble. He's talking about the kind of trouble that makes you think, well, I don't even know if there's a God anymore. I don't even know if I believe in Him anymore. That kind of trouble. And Jesus says it's inevitable. We live in a world that is broken and cursed, a world that exists in the shadow of sin. All of creation, the book of Romans says, all of creation has been subjected to frustration and groans in longing to be liberated from its bondage to decay. In other words, the world is falling apart. So trouble is going to find you. But then Jesus ends this verse by saying, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. In other words, Jesus has already done what's necessary to take care of the curse. He's defeated the world. Jesus says, don't lose sight of the big picture. Don't give in to despair. Remember, the end of the story is a good one. Pete Wilson, in his book called Plan B, points out that this one verse can lead to two kinds of bad theology. There are two parts to this verse, and if you read them in isolation from one another, or you, 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 you emphasize one to the exclusion of the other, it can lead you to some pretty bad places. On the one hand, if you just focus on the part that says, in this world you will have trouble, you could develop a mental framework that says, this world stinks. It can make you a very pessimistic person. Everything is bad, everything is a threat. For instance, I'm reading a book right now, I'm in a group a pastor's group that where, where we read books together and, and, and someone chose and assigned us this book. It's a book about all of the crises that face the church right now. Um, 25 threats to Christianity. Each chapter is dedicated to another threat, whether, you know, gay marriage or, or, or pluralization or, or the deification of technology or things like that. And, each, and I, I'll tell you, it is the most depressing book I've ever read. Because you read a chapter and you say, oh, yeah, oh, that's bad. And then you read the next chapter and you go, oh, e, you know, that's bad. And for 25 chapters, this thing goes on and says, well, here's what's happening, here's what's happening. And you start to think, well, Christians don't have a chance. 
If you only focus on the in this world you will have trouble part, it can be pretty hopeless. But you can also make the mistake of focusing only on the second part, the part that says, well, I've overcome the world. That's, it's a much more optimistic place to be, but it can force you to gloss over some real pain. It can turn you into like, the characters in the Lego movie that you know, walk around going, everything is awesome all the time, when, when it's not. Wilson writes, if you take this statement, the, 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 the I have overcome the world, if you take that statement as your mental framework, you start to think that there will never be any trouble or at least no serious trouble. Nothing bad's going to happen to me as long as I'm following Jesus. If you cling only to this statement, you force yourself to live in a false reality. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, you just pretend everything is great and all the charts of your life are going to keep moving up and to the right. And in the process, you're probably setting yourself up for a fall Because your false reality will eventually be shattered. We really need to take the two parts of this verse and we need to keep them together. As Christians, we need to be realistic about the world we live in. We need to recognize the fallenness of our world and acknowledge that there's very real pain. There's trouble. And yet, we need to remember that as Christians, we have a great story to tell. Our story has a good ending. And that's the power of that word, but. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. God has overcome the world. This verse makes me think about the word joy. Jesus doesn't use that word in John 16, verse 33, but he does use it quite a bit earlier in that same chapter, John 16. We talk about joy quite a bit here at Hope Church. We've made it the center of our mission statement when we said that we're here to bring joy to Jesus, experience joy in him. It's our conviction that the Christian life is a life of joy, that, that God's will for us is that we would be filled with joy. Personally, I feel that Christianity has suffered from the stereotype of black-clad pilgrims all sitting in rows with long faces and somber expressions. The idea that church is supposed to be um, somber and even uncomfortable flies in the face of the Bible. Jesus promised joy for his followers, and so an emphasis of our church is on living in that joy together. But we have to be careful when we talk about joy because the temptation is to equate joy with happiness. Because words like rejoice and jubilation bring to mind people laughing and celebrating. We think joy only exists when those feelings of happiness are present. But in truth, joy and happiness are different ideas and spring from different sources. Happiness comes from the world around us. It's conditioned by what's happening to us at the moment. So if people treat us good, if things are going well in life, if if we have what we want, we tend to be happy. And and if our circumstances are not favorable, then we tend to be unhappy. It's all conditioned on what's happening to us. Joy, on the other hand, throbs throughout Scripture as a profound, compelling quality of life that transcends the events and disasters which may dog God's people. Joy is a divine dimension of living that's not shackled by our circumstances. It's created in us by God's Spirit, allows us to feel happy, to be content and peaceful and glad, even when our situation is unhappy. I define Christian joy like this. Christian joy is a confident gladness that remains even in difficult circumstances. Christian joy is resilient. And it's joy that Jesus is talking about in John 16. Jesus is promising those who follow him that they will experience a joy that is greater than the trouble of this world. In fact, that's the thing I most want you to take home with you today. Jesus promises you a joy that rises above any trouble. There may be moments in your life or days or even entire seasons of your life which feel like trouble, trouble, trouble. But Jesus promises that for those who trust in him, there can still be peace in the midst of that trouble. And another word for that is joy. And it's available to you and me. So let me back up a few verses in John 16 to verses 19 through 24. And this this is where Jesus starts talking about joy. 
And we'll learn three things about this joy that Jesus has promised us. The first thing is this. Christian joy is resurrection bought. Our joy finds its source in Jesus' victory over death. Look at verses 19 and 20. Jesus saw what excuse me, Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, and so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more? And then after a little while you will see me. Well, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Again, keep in mind the context. Jesus has been telling his disciples repeatedly in the last few chapters that he's about to depart. He knows that he's about to die. They're they're 12, 15 hours away from the cross. He knows he's about to die, but the disciples aren't getting it. So in, in chapter 16, verse 16, just a few verses earlier, he says to them, in a little while you'll see me no more, then after a little while you'll see me. And so now the disciples are trying to understand what Jesus means by in a little while. And so Jesus is explaining. Jesus' mission on earth is nearly at an end. There's just one more fundamental, all-important act for Jesus to carry out. His sacrifice on the cross. So in a little while, he says, a very short time, they're not going to see him anymore. He's going to die on the cross. The first little while is this this next 12-hour period leading to his death. But then Jesus says in another little while, they will see him again. And that's the resurrection. Jesus knows that his death is coming, but he also knows that he's going to be walking back out of his tomb. So the second little while is the time from Friday afternoon to Sunday morning. And Jesus knows that in that first little while, his disciples are going to weep and they're going to mourn. He knows it's going to be tough, that the world is going to be rejoicing, the devil's going to be dancing because Jesus is going to be dead. There will be trouble. But then after that second little while, Jesus knows their grief is going to be transformed into joy. He knows that stone will be rolled away. He knows he's going to walk and talk with his disciples again. He knows that death cannot beat him. And it's that empty tomb. It's our Easter hope that serves as the fountain of our joy. We can have joy that rises above all trouble because we know that Jesus is the victor over death. Whatever happens to us, we know this one thing for sure. Jesus is alive. He's overcome. And so we can have joy. Personally, this is a thought I fall back onto again and again and again. When I'm having a stressful day, when I'm worried about my kids, when I, when I get news that somebody I care about is, is, is sick, when I, when I hear about something that's happening in, in one of your lives and, and it breaks my heart, when a situation looks dreadful and gloomy, I, I always remember this. Jesus walked out of his grave. And that's the bottom line. Jesus faced our greatest enemy and he beat it. And that reminds me that no matter how bad things look, the situation will be getting better. So Christian joy is resurrection bought. Second, Christian joy is recession proof. In the midst of the economic crisis back in 2008, 2009, I was driving down the road one day when I saw a sign that said, God is recession proof. And it just sort of stuck in my mind. My point here is not to talk about the economy, is to say that Christian joy stands up to any circumstance. Christian joy hangs in there even when things are tough. Verses 21 and 22. Jesus says, A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. Jesus wants to illustrate for his disciples to help them understand what they are about to experience when he goes to the cross. So he says it's going to be like childbirth. Not that any of them can exactly relate. Not that I can relate in that way. But those of you who have had children can probably confirm that it's painful. They call it labor. It's hard work. And that experience of bringing a child into the world, Jesus says it's anguish. But 
Those of you who have had children also know the feeling of joy that comes when that precious baby has been placed in your arms. The overwhelming gladness that comes over you at that time. Again, it's not exactly something I can relate to, but I can only imagine that having that baby placed in your arms for the first time must be one of the best feelings in the world because otherwise all of you women would only have one child. Right? There's no way you would choose to go through that again if if not for knowing the end of the story, what that feels like. And Jesus is saying that that's what life is like. Sometimes we're going to go through circumstances that hurt, like when he goes to the cross, but he will be there in the resurrection and we will rejoice. It will be like a new birth. And look at how he describes that sense of joy in verse 22. He says, no one will be able to take away your joy. No one. It's unstealable. It's permanent. It's here to stay. Not Satan, not sin, not circumstances, not the world. Not anyone can take this joy away once you have it. It's recession proof. No one will take away your joy. This is important for us to think about because as we've seen, our circumstances will from time to time be difficult. We have to avoid the notion that says if we're strong enough Christians, nothing bad will ever happen to us. That's simply not true. Jesus never promises that everybody who believes in him will always be healthy and wealthy. Jesus says just the opposite, in fact. He says in this world you will have trouble. Pain and suffering, cancer and relational problems, financial difficulties, employment issues, conflicts, sin, trials and tribulations. It's all possible, even likely, for Christians. Jesus doesn't promise that we just get out of those things. But what he does promise is that we can have joy even in the midst of those troubles. A resilient, confident gladness that stands up even in difficult situations. The great promise of Romans 8.28 says that in all things God is working for the good of those who belong to him. We know that whatever we are going through, God has a good plan for us. It's like childbirth. A time of suffering and pain followed by rejoicing. It doesn't mean that we don't mourn or grieve. The Bible says we should mourn with those who mourn. It doesn't, ever, it doesn't mean we won't experience sorrow. We will. But beyond that, always for those who belong to Jesus is joy. Unspeakable, unstealable, unbeatable joy. So Christian joy is resurrection bought. Christian joy is recession proof. The third, Christian joy is received by faith. This kind of resilient joy comes from knowing that God is on our side. Verses 23 and 24. Jesus says, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive. Your joy will be complete. Jesus tells us he'll give us whatever we ask in his name. Jesus is talking about the amazing power that's available to us when we pray as his people. Now you could read this as though Jesus is giving us a magic word that will help us get whatever we want. Instead of saying abracadabra, you just say in Jesus' name at the end of your prayers and then God is obligated to do what you've asked. In fact, this is the fourth time in three chapters that Jesus had said something like this. He keeps saying, you may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Or, or ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Or the, the Father will give whatever you ask in my name. Clearly, Jesus wants us to know there's something very significant about praying in his name. But at the same time, given the context in which Jesus says this, when he says, in this world you'll have trouble, he can't be telling us that his name is some sort of magic talisman against anything bad ever happening to us. Jesus is not saying that all we have to do is name it and claim it and all of our sickness will be healed or all of our financial needs met. Instead, we need to remember that when Jesus says, in my name, he means more than just something to tack on before you say amen at the end of a prayer. A name in the Bible is a very important thing. It stands for the essential character of the person or thing being named. It includes the named person's nature, authority, character, and essence. So what this is saying is that you have to pray in line with Jesus' character. You have to pray in Jesus' authority, which means praying for things that Jesus would want. So in that sense, then, praying in Jesus' name means learning to want the things God wants for us. It's a, it's a way of praying in faith where you're basically saying, God, whatever you feel is best for me, that is what I'm more than willing to accept. I have faith, God, that you're on my side. 
I don't mean to water down Jesus' promise here. The privilege of praying in Jesus' name is a powerful opportunity. By encouraging us to go to the Father in His name, Jesus is telling us in no uncertain terms that God is with us, that He loves us, that He wants what's best for us, like a dad caring for his children. It's an assurance that God wants the best for us, and that should be a reason for great joy. So what's the takeaway from today's message? Jesus wants us to know that real joy is available, a deep, abiding joy that goes beyond the feelings of the moment, a joy that rises above any trouble this world can send our way. So the application, I think, is for us to take heart. That's what Jesus says in verse 33. He says, take heart. Other translations say, be of good cheer, or take courage, or, or be brave. In other words, tell your heart to believe this. Tell your heart to rejoice and believe and stand up and trust Him no matter what. Tell your heart to believe that He's overcome the world and, and this joy will flood in. You can face your worldly troubles because Jesus has overcome them by the cross and resurrection. So tell your heart to believe this. Tell your heart to believe that the resurrection power of Jesus is available for you. Tell your heart to believe that this unstealable joy can be yours, even in the midst of great anguish. Tell your heart to believe that because you come in Jesus' name, God really is going to do what is best for you. Tell your heart to believe that in between the little wiles of verse 19, something huge and beautiful and powerful and majestic happened. Jesus died for sinners like you and me. And He was raised to life again. And that death on the cross and that resurrection that followed overcame the evil of the world and the evil of Satan and the evil even of our sins. And if we believe on Him and if we take courage in Him and if we cheer ourselves in Him, then no matter what the world throws at us, we can have joy. Horatio Spafford was a prominent and well-known lawyer in Chicago in the 1860s. He's also a close friend, prominent supporter of the evangelist Dwight Moody. Spafford made heavy investments in Chicago real estate when the Great Chicago Fire reduced the city to ashes in 1871. He lost a huge portion of his fortune. Two years later, Spafford decided his family should take a holiday somewhere in Europe, and he chose to go to England because he knew his friend Dwight Moody would be preaching there. So he made arrangements for his family to travel by steamship, but he was delayed because of business, so he sent his family on ahead. His wife, Anna, and their four daughters, 11-year-old Tanetta, 9-year-old Elizabeth, 5-year-old Margaret Lee, and 2-year-old Annie. Now, on November 22, 1873, while crossing the Atlantic, the Spafford steamship, the Villa du Havre, was struck by an iron sailing vessel 226 people lost their lives, including all four of Spafford's daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy. Upon arriving in England, she sent him a telegram that began, Saved Alone. So Spafford quickly arranged to get ship, to get passage to England to go to comfort his grieving wife. And as the ship he was on passed over the location where his four daughters had drowned, he went down to his cabin and he wrote out these words. He wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul.
know you have trouble. And Jesus said, you would. And we all do. But take heart. Because Jesus has overcome the world. As you go through this week, I, it's my prayer that, that's, that you can say that. Whatever comes your way, that you can say, it is well with my soul. I invite you to stand for the blessing. As you go, may the Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May He go before you, to guide you, above you, to watch over you. May He go behind you to protect you, and beneath you to lift you up. May He go beside you to befriend you, and most of all, may He go within you to give you His peace. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Bless the Lord.